So guys and girls, here's episode 154 of the Revive Yourself podcast. Literally just finished recording with Tom Barnett. It's the second episode of what we promised and we go into a lot of different topics. In fact, a lot around common law as we as we discussed about how we're going to bulletproof ourselves from these mandatory vaccinations or anything the government tries to mandate etc before we get onto that if you can um, support us in this way the revive yourself podcast then head on over to www.reviveyourself.co click on our shop and it's just full of some of the world's best health boosting products um, from evolution organics we've got the products i always love to recommend living fuel two scoops of any living fuel product is the equivalent of 260 dollars worth of organic produce it's a great supplement or even a meal replacement if you want um this is absolutely fabulous then we've got other other products around for milk thistle for your liver probiotics if you go down stuff from ancient purity pearl powder and royal jelly are two of my favorites as well as the vitamin d3 and k2 liposomal so your body absorbs it straight away hasn't got going in the gut it gets absorbed straight in the mouth as well as the uh, liposomal vitamin c that we've got there as well um so any of those options are are, are fantastic um and if you head over to blueblocks.com b-l-u-b-l-o-x.com yeah they've got the best blue blocking glasses on the planet in fact i'm actually interviewing andy man for, uh, next week second interview um if you put in the code revive on the website you get gonna get 15 percent off 10 or 15 percent off i think it's 15 uh as well best for the best essential oils on the planet please head on over to www.essentialoilwizardry.com once again you put in code revive in small letters you're gonna get 10 percent off any products there and if you're looking for essential oils dr nick berry a friend of ours you know here at revive great uh great guy we've got two fabulous podcasts with him you can even look them up but he's got uh, just brilliant videos for every single product that he sells it'll go through what, what what product you need and what it can do for you um so i was if you're looking for i've had a lot of messages through actually recently about water filtration systems and the, the system that i recommend is from a company called aquatair uh, if you scroll down you'll find it uh, and they do options for one two three or four bedroom house house plus um as well as hard or, or soft water depending on what you've got and uh, i've actually got a great interview with the, with the uh, owner of that graham brebner he's a former rocket scientist and his system takes that all the nasties you know chemicals pollutants heavy, um, heavy metals etc parasites so go there for that um and yeah i think that's, that's that covers that so here we go with the interview with tom barnett first of all we cover a few different topics in in terms of people that have called him out on his videos um they're going to the virus and covid19 what's been happening there uh, some of the interviews that have been done on London Real with Dr. Patar and uh, Dr. Andrew Kaufman. And then we spend the majority of the interview talking about common law versus statutory law and the things you're going to have to learn if you want to bulletproof yourself and your family going forward uh, in these times. So without further ado, here he, is, here he is, if I can speak, here he is. Enjoy and I'll see you on the other side. Then it's all stuck to the bottom. But um, yeah, sorry to in- in- interrupt you there, mate. Yeah. It's going to be a flow. So oh, that's all right. Have you ever had? Have you that's ever cool. had someone who like you send it to people and they don't and, and like say say you've like done what you've done with social security number there or birth certificate and yep. the people you send it to don't know what the hell you're you're done because I mean how yep. many people actually know about yep. this? Do you know what I mean? Because I, I um, not yeah, not yeah. many people would probably <laughs> so, know. So workers, general workers, probably none, unless they've had them come in before. Um, but anyone in their legal department or their finance and accounts department knows exactly what it is. Oh, really? So if somebody gets back to you and they just say, hey, look, I don't know what to do with this. This is what Mark did. This is what I learned from Mark. They go, look, what do I do with this? You just say, well, am I your legal department? So don't you have a legal department? They go, yeah, well, why don't you send it to them? Once they've accepted it, it doesn't matter who accepts it. The secretary, the anybody who accepts it, that is accepted by the company. Now, the way that you know that it's accepted is that you've got to send these things by registered mail mm. because otherwise there's no proof that you sent it and there's no proof that they received it. So that could go to court, for example. Your Honor, I sent them I sent them payment. And then they just go, well, we never got anything. And the judge will go to you. Well, have you got proof that you sent it or they received it? And you're like, no. Well, I sent it. Well, that's not proof. you know. So you've got to use registered mail. When you use registered mail, uh, it has a receipt 
you get a receipt or you can look it up and it shows the exact time that it was received and who signed for it. They have to sign. Somebody has to sign for it. So it'll say in your records, received at 8.52 a.m. on Wednesday, the 15th of April um, by Ryan Martin. It'll, ha- it'll say that. So that is your proof of receipt and proof that you sent it. You know what I mean? So didn't didn't um, he, say, he said something, Mark said the other day, he said about, I've had people there before. They said, yeah, well, we got it, but nothing was in it. So... You not only need to send yeah, the register, yeah. you he, need to send you need to send it with with someone else that's signed that something's in it, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's um what Mark's got is he developed what's called a um, proof of mailing. So the proof of mailing is a form that says uh, this registered mail envelope and you have the code of the registered mail envelope and it says that uh, it contains one, two, three, four, and five documents. It says document one, notice, document two, invoice, document three, uh, whatever, and document four, this this um, proof of mailing. So it actually states exactly what it's in there and it's signed by a witness to say that that was put in. I've actually sneakily kept aside some some of those and filmed with a phone, folding each part of the notice and put them in the envelope, hoping that they'll say it didn't have anything in it. So, cause I've got the proof. I'm actually hoping one day somebody says that it, I don't put them in there anymore, but I keep them separate. Because I just hope that they go, oh, no, we didn't get it. And I'll say, well, that's interesting because I've actually got the proof here of what's in the sealed envelope. So why are you lying? You're lying, aren't you? Oh, I really want to do that to someone because they're just going to go, oh, oh, shit, oh, no, fuck, I just screwed up. Because <laughs> <laughs> if they lie, that carries huge penalties. You lie in a courtroom or you lie on an affidavit, you're screwed, you know. So I'm, I'm trying, that's called like, that's called trying to trick people, fish hooking. <laughs> right. So once you start to learn this sort of stuff, you can get a bit creative and you just go, hey, how can I, um, how can I entrap these people? Because that'll be fun. You know, you get to the stage where you're so, you have, you are so far beyond having fear of authoritarian bodies that you actually want to trick them into incriminating themselves because that'll be fun for you. So, um, but that, yeah, basically, mm-hmm. if you're just starting out, you want to include that, um, that certificate of mailing to say what's in there so that nobody can turn around and say, yeah, we've got a registered mail envelope, but there was nothing in it. Cause unless you can prove there was something in it, they don't have to prove that there was not something not in there. So, yeah. So it's really interesting all this, cause I wanted to get into like what people can do around vaccinations and et cetera. But why would, this mm-hmm. is the thing like, because why have they, what was the point? If this was common law and there's statutory law, what, why did they develop this? Like what, I mean, it seems like, and, and how we've all bought into it. I mean, this is something that most people, you start talking about this, all you think you're crazy. So it's funny how mm. everything that I put something up the other day, it's like question everything you th- you think to be common knowledge. And like, this is something that, you know, I, I'm with, like with help, someone threw something at me, I'd be like, bang, bang, bang. I'd be able to just like de- judo, deflect it or go on the attack. This is where I want to get with this. This is why I've been very like um, I've been probably a bit pain in your ass to be honest with you, because I, I want to get to <laughs> I want to get to the point where like like you like where you're not because I've had that before. You're driving down the road, police officer behind you. You're like ah, oh, and you start to feel a bit like mm. oh my god, make sure that I'm not doing anything wrong, etc. Even though I'm not doing anything mm-hmm. wrong, because I, yeah. I've had I've had experiences with policemen before, uh, which which aren't great. Um, just in terms of, mm. um, I've, I've had some great ones like you. So some really nice, uh, just experiences. I remember once, and I was really young, going to like the, I think it was a Queen Mother's funeral back when I used to actually like, uh, well, support the royal family in that sort of way. It's weird, <laughs> it's weird because the more you get into this, it's, it's it's hard because I used to like quite patriotic for certain things. But I remember being in London mm. and asking, we didn't know where we were going. We was only young, um, and I was like, oh, to an officer, do you can you do you know where this is? Uh, do you know where do you know where the mail is? I think it was, yeah. And uh, he was like from Essex Constabulary around where I, I'm from. And he's like, what am I? Fucking road map. I was like, no, just asking for help. And then I asked someone, another policeman down the road, and he was from up north, I think, from Yorkshire. And he was like, oh, it's just down here, down there. And like, cool, thank you very much, sir. Like, just normal human being. And I think some of them are human beings, and some of them, mm. like anyone, are just drunk on power. You know, like, you get the same with traffic yeah. wardens and things like that, right? You, uh, I said to someone before mm. the other day, it's like, are we, when he's putting a ticket on the car, he's coming out of a, hospital i remember this actually when my best friend died we were coming out of the hospital it was a neurological hospital they charged like four pound for 15 minutes to stay there and he literally just died and he put the car put a ticket on my car and i was like 
what are you doing? Like, where's the humanity? And he was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he actually was, you know what I mean? He was actually all right. But I was sitting there thinking like, if you actually mm -hmm. talk to people like that, sometimes it's like, we're all human here. We're all in this game together. I don't understand what, but some people are yeah. drunk on power, unfortunately. And you see that a lot. And it's just about being, this is why I see it sometimes in, in courtrooms with barristers and, um, and yeah, just lawyers, etc. And it's like, they're not interested in the truth. They're just interested in winning. Does that make sense? And it's yeah. like, where yeah, are we clearly. here? And where are we here? And so, no, I do get it. But why, yeah, my, my original question before I went on the diatribe, my apologies, is why did they create create this? And how comes, uh, I mean, you said before that the legal team will understand it. So if the legal, legal people do understand it, will they actually be using this themselves a lot of the time? Two questions. Yeah, and to the point where sometimes, yeah, like uh, Mark's actually had a few a few cases, run-ins with lawyers and things where the, he's seen the look on their faces where they're like, oh, wow, I can use a promissory note to discharge my liabilities. Mm. You know, they start to get excited. Um, it depends on the type, on the area of law that they're in and the accounts that they're in. But yeah, they do have, they do know this stuff. Um, so what's going to happen is this is the principle called, um, the principle is essentially, uh, st it's, you call it standing your ground. It's, it's what happens when, you do these things that you know is right, but it gets thrown back in your face. You have to know how to hold your position and holding your position or standing your ground is just meaning that you don't let that fish hook that they're offering you trip you up. They're really just testing you to see if you really know what you're doing. So you might get um, somebody, you know, call you up or send you some mail back. Look, we don't accept this. Like, what, what is it? We don't know what to do with it. But you've already put in your notice when you send them, you know, your payment, you say, by accepting, if you hold on to this for more than 72 hours, that is your acceptance of this financial instrument, of this money order, of this promissory note, whatever it is. And if they do, that means they can't turn around and say, well, we don't know what to do with it. So, well, it's in your hands now. You've accepted it. You've accepted it because you've held it if you haven't returned it. So this is a trick that I learned from Mark is that, for example, to discharge a $5,000 or a $10,000 uh, debt with somebody, you could send them a check for five hundred dollars, and you say, "I offer you this check in good faith. Um, if you ex by accepting it, um, you have accepted the terms and conditions of this notice, which means that they have accepted that it discharges the amount. What they'll often do is cash it. If they cash that, that means they've accepted it. But even if they don't cash it, it means that if they don't return it to you as you stated within seventy two hours, they've accepted it." So it doesn't matter what they say from then on. You just have to know. You, you just have to know that they're going to try to get around it in some way. But they've accepted it. That's the end, end of story. You don't even have to communicate with them after this. So um, what happens is some people get themselves into trouble by re recontracting with people, and you recontract by getting back into a, a discussion and answering questions. Or saying that I did making claims. They send it back, or they they call you and say, "Well, we don't accept that." And you say, "But, but I did. I did send it to you. Or I did do this. Or I did that." And now you're answering their questions and you're making claims. Now you're recontracting with them. And before that, it was done. They were just trying to fish hook you. It's what debt collectors do. You know, you you wipe a debt with a bank. A debt collector is still probably going to call you. Are you are you Tom Barnett? You answer, start answering that question. Oh, well, you've got a debt with them. But I paid that. I paid that. I did whatever. You're just recontracting with a new entity which has no you, you, and you can that only happens by you doing it you only have to just get them off your back who are you that's so all you ask who are you away from i don't i don't think i have any business with you who are you after oh tom barnett oh he doesn't live here you got the wrong number see you later don't call back that's all you have to do it's like but from people don't do they know that so they never come to a door. But if they came to the door, they'd do the same thing. You'd answer the door, oh, hello, and you go, oh, I'm, I'm Joe Blow from uh, the debt collectors of such and such. I'd just go, righto, what do you want? Oh, we're after Tom Barnett. You, no, he doesn't live here. Uh, well, who lives here? It wasn't none of your business, but Tom Barnett doesn't live here. You, you must be on the – you've come to the wrong place. Get off my property, otherwise you're trespassing. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're just – you're not answering questions. You're not answering to be in a name. You, they have no business coming to your door. They're only after a name and you're, you're not the name. So when you say, no, he doesn't live here. Are you him? I don't answer questions. He doesn't live here though. You should get off my property. Otherwise you're trespassing. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, do you understand based on, 100%. I'm saying that he just, doesn't live. 
yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I'm getting what you're saying. Like just now, yeah, I literally yeah. had, had an epiphany where you're saying like that, like your your name is that, and you are this. It's really interesting. That was yeah. just the first time I really sort of was like, ah, like you almost your name is yeah, almost a legal <laughs> document. Like, and it's just like, it is, and you're yeah. and you're this man. It's like, yeah, okay, I, I, I yeah. answer to that sometimes, but. I don't know who you're looking for. That's not me. And it's like really. Well, not that's uh, not I me. wouldn't even say it's that. Not, it's not me, but it's like I know. I did, the, well, you said about the plane thing was interesting. Yeah. You said I answer, no, but you just you said like I sometimes answer that name, but I don't know who you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. That's more what you use in court. So when you go into a courtroom, and it, uh, it's always best not to go to court. So I'll get into why in a minute. But you you generally don't want to go to court because it's sometimes not a level playing field. Even if you do everything right, it can sometimes not work out in your favor. Um, rarely, but depending on who you've got, you might have an asshole magistrate, but that's why Mark's had them fired because they overstepped their bounds. But you need to you need to be at his level to get them fired, you know? Like most people all just cop it and then go home crying or whatever. But um, when you go into a courtroom, it's always you're called to the stand and then they ask you, are you Mr. Ryan Martin? Now, Mr. is a statutory term and Ryan Martin is the name, the, the statutory name. If you go, yes, you're now agreeing to being that name. So the way you get around that, if you say no, they'll say, well, if I'm going to make a decision even if you're not here. They have people who have been arrested in the courtroom for failing to appear in court. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. So they'll go, uh, are you Mr. Ryan Martin? And you just say, well, I'm a man and I, no, 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 no. Are you Mr. Ryan Martin? Yes or no? That's a yes or no answer. That's what they'll do to you. And if you go, no, I'm not, I'm not my name. You say, well, um, bailiff arrest this man for not appearing in court. So it's weird that you could be arrested in a courtroom for not appearing in court. But what they're saying is that you are, are not answering in the right way. If you answer yes, you're contracting with them. So the way you answer that is you say, well, I answer to that name but I reserve all of my rights and I waive all benefits and privileges. The reason you say that is rights exist in the realm of the private and the living. Benefits and privileges are what are awarded to wards of the state. So a statutory dead thing is awarded benefits and privileges. So you just say, I answer to that name, Your Honor, but I waive all of my rights. Uh, sorry, I reserve all of my rights and I waive all benefits and privileges. Now you've answered the question the right way. When you, if you do that to somebody who's like an airline hostess or a police officer, can work, but generally you just don't want to answer their questions. So it was great though that you got it. So that door example is, is you, you got it exactly. They're after a name and you're a guy. You're, you're not a name. You're a man. You're a living being. So you've, you've now got that ability, which I'm hoping other people are getting that ability too, is to separate yourself from the legal entity, which is the name. So they're coming here and they're going, I'm here for the name and you're not that name. Obviously you've separated yourself from that name. So you go, well, I'm not the name. The name doesn't live here. So I don't know who you're after, but you should get off my property. So you've kind of got that now, right? So that's, mm. that's separation. It's, it's interesting. I was just literally in my head, my, like my name or like Ryan Martin just went in the air and I was here and I was like, ah, <laughs> I know it might, it might sound silly, but that was like, how I sort yeah. of did it. I was like, oh, okay. He's like, don't know who you're looking for, but yeah. he's he's not here. Or oh, they're not here. They're not here. Yeah. yeah. They're not here. They're not here but they're really not good here. point, though. Really good point on this is that when you're talking about mandatory vaccines, the mandatory vaccine applies to the name. So it's exactly the same principle. If you can learn to separate yourself from the name, then you understand that the name is liable for a mandatory vaccine and not the living man or woman. So that is why you have to learn how to not consent to these offers. Cause again, it's only an offer. They're offering to give you mandatory vaccines. Uh, so the way you do that is to notice them to not remain silent. If you remain silent, you're essentially assenting to a mandatory vaccine or a flu shot or whatever it's going to be. Besides, so how, how are they? Okay. So there's, Go for it, go for it. Sorry, go. Well, there's two examples recently. One is a lady who I know, she, she said to me, she works for one of the, her husband works for one of the major banks. The major, he's been working from home recently because of the whole, you know, coming into the office thing. They've emailed him and said, you have to get a flu shot before you can come back to work. 
Now, there's two things wrong with that. One, he's not noticed. It's an email. You have to receive notice by written communication. So he hasn't received that. Two, you need uh, equitable time in order for that to happen. So they can't say, work's coming back next week. You've got to get a flu shot this week. Otherwise, you can't come back to work. That is not equitable time. You have to give people equitable time, which is um, just pause there for a second. Equitable time comes under the principles of equity. Now, when you were asking before about common law and why people don't know this, common law just is case law. Common law is not the remedy. The remedy is equity. Um, what happened is, I forget the year, but Mark will handle that when we do the interview with him, when I interview him. Uh, this came out in the 1800s, I think, where common law was not providing the remedy for the small man on the street. There was for, for a common law or case law to be put into effect, it's expensive. It has to be a trial. There has to be a jury. That's expensive for the court. So if there's not a predetermined case law for you to rely on, then you might not win your case. So that's when equity was created. And equity just means what is fair what is just and what is equitable. That's all equity means. So therefore, if you went into a courtroom and you say, and somebody says, well, we're going to put you in jail for 20 years because you didn't pay a parking fine, you'd say, well, how is that fair? How is that just and how is that equitable? You know, I offered to pay, this is a good example to bring up, a guy won in court for offering to pay with coffee beans one time. He had a debt with some company, can't remember the exact details, but he said, Your Honor, I've got no money. You know, I was, the judge said, what do you got? He pulled out of his pockets. He had some coffee beans in his pocket. He said, i got these coffee beans. And he put them on the table. And the judge accepted that as payment because he offered something. That was an equitable remedy because the guy had no money. Well, how is he going to pay a debt with no money to whatever this company was? So he gave an offer. And it would be rude and not equitable of the uh, creditor to not accept that because that's all he had. So in the court's rule, that was done. Debt gone, paid with coffee beans. It's interesting because this is all... So... Like, yeah, I was just going to say when people were saying, keep that keep that thought. But people were saying, like, who benefits out of this whole COVID thing? And they're like, oh, the economy's gone. It's like, well, who benefits? Conglomerates like Amazon and Google, whose stocks are going through the roof. The small businesses are all gone. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, but hospitals are losing money. Yeah, apart from the vaccine companies that are going to sell billions of these vaccines and, and they're going to make trillions of yeah. dollars and they can pay for the hospitals, you know. So, uh, and so people say they don't get it. They don't understand what's going on. So I just wanted to put that in there because what you just said about how it, the little yeah. man was getting squashed. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so that's, that's where equity came about because it was too expensive for people to keep running trials to create case law so that somebody else who needed to rely on case law, they couldn't do it. So that's why equity was created. And equity is the remedy for all of this stuff we're facing now. Equity is the remedy for uh, forced vaccines, for um, being denied travel to places and whatever else. Um, equity is also how you can get yourself out of uh, big debts with people that try to claim that you owe them money and, you know, like pol fines from police, fines from government, tax debts, all that sort of stuff. Everything that I've spoken about applies to tax as well. You owe the government $100,000. Technically, of course, you don't owe them anything, but they say that you owe them. You can offer them a, a remedy. You can say, here's two and a half grand. Um, and they can say, well, we don't accept that. But if you know, if you put it in the notices the right way, they have accepted it doesn't matter what they say it's their actions if they they've accepted it by holding on to it for example so um then so how, the, how do you know they've kept the trick there is 72 hours because if they don't send it back to you within what time frame is it when the letter was sent by is that what they put it on no the receipt receipt of and you know when they received it because you sent it by registered mail right if you're doing this right you send it by registered mail right. you saw on thursday the 20th at 5 p.m it reached their office it was signed Time, clock's ticking from there. Thursday to Friday at 5 p.m., 24 hours. Saturday at 5 p.m., that's 48. Sunday at 5 p.m., that's 72 hours. That's a tricky way to do it because most people aren't going to reply to stuff on a weekend, but it still counts. It's still 72 hours. Let's say you did it nice and it arrived on a Tuesday. But Wednesday at 5 p.m., that's 24. Thursday, 48. Friday, 72 hours. If it has not reached your mailbox by 5 p.m. on the Friday, that's 72 hours, they've accepted it. That's it. 
So that's the law. So, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll try to they'll try to fish hook you. And oh well, we we didn't receive anything. Or we received this thing that we don't accept. And they they say we don't accept this, but their actions have shown that they accepted it. This is the trick. This is this is holding your position because you know that they did accept it because based on your clause of um ex- your liability clauses and things you in your uh, notice, it says so they. They can say what they want, but their actions have said that they have accepted payment. So you don't want to then go arguing with them or or, or trying to, but no, but you, but I did, but you sent but this, to. blah blah blah. You're just contracting with them again. This you is, don't have to. This is it's where, their actions. This is where you and like this is where when you know and you're very calm with it, it's like people get stressed about these things because they're like, oh, what happens if I go to prison or what happens if this, for example, when Mark's thing got thrown out by the magistrate or whatever. Because he knew he could, he didn't have a debt to pay or whatever. He could just be very calm and be like, "I know what I'm doing." And so when you know what you're doing, you don't get stressed because you know it's like I'm in the right. And you can throw all this stuff at me, and it doesn't matter because I'm, I'm just, I know that I'm right. And so that's a very key because I imagine people sitting there going, "But what if they do this? Yeah. What if they do that?" It's like you need to get to the point where mm. you're relaxed and you're just and you understand yeah. what you're doing because, as you say, people can throw stuff back at you. But once you know the law, so. Mm. They might even try and take you, and they will. They might even try they and take will you to throw it back at you. Yeah, they might even try and take you to court, right? Yeah, they can. Uh, okay, so I've had a couple do that over one of the gas bills that I paid with my birth certificate. They say they didn't accept it. I know they did because they held on to it for seventy-two hours. If you used a forensic accountant, you would also be able to trace the fact that they cashed it. They'll securitize it because they have the power. If this is a thing, whoever makes the claim has to provide a remedy. You can't do this for your local tradesman who did your plumbing and gave you a, an 80 quid um, plumbing bill. You can't use your birth certificate to pay for that because the guy has not got the facility to securitize a signature, right? So this is only for large uh, companies that turn over more than a million dollars a year. If they provide a tearaway slip or they provide a, a um, payment slip of any kind, they have the ability to securitize a signature. So you're only doing this with massive companies, governmental departments, huge gas companies, huge electrical companies, um, you know, uh, the, the police. These are all people who can securitize well, what a signature. Was it, what I was going to say uh, makes complete sense. But when, for example, the police sent me, just going to give you an example, sent me that fine for the, the park, for the driving, whatever, they send you a document. Yep. And that's the only document they send you, and they say you have to fill this out. And so in your head, it's like, well, I, I, I'm thinking already that's I wouldn't fill that out. I'd send them something else back. I'd just send them a letter back, right? I wouldn't send, I wouldn't fill out their form. I'd send them something back which would say da 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 whatever. And so because they send you mm. that, automatically you think that's what I have to send out. Does that make sense? I'll send back. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, it, it, again, that's only an offer. You know, mm. there's. Um, so yeah, so just to get back to what I was saying, the um, there's a legal company trying to send me emails saying that you're going to go to court for not paying your gas bill, but I know it's just official because I know I paid the gas bill. Because otherwise, they they wouldn't be sending me emails; they'd be sending me notices. They'd be sending me an actual court notice. Here is your summons to appear in court. But they're just sending these things. Oh, this is that. This is this matter we're going to take to court. And if somebody else got that, they might stress out. But I know what it is. I know that it's nothing. It's not a real thing. So. Um, it's it's this it's these tricks that people will try to play. Do you reply to, to that? To get you to engage. Did no, you reply you don't, to that? You don't reply to it. I did. I replied the first time they sent me an email. It said, "Oh, you." And I sent an email back. I said, "Thanks very much for the email. Um, as you'd be aware, or you might not be aware, but I've settled my account with this gas company. I said I've also got a counterclaim against them, which is being heard in a local civil tribunal, which it is, and." Um, uh, if you, as a lawyer, if you are a real lawyer, you would know that emails don't count as correspondence. If you want to engage with me, you need to make it in writing and you have to send it to my PO box. So here's my PO box. Send me anything. They sent me one <clears throat> thing. I sent a notice back. So it's, it's a notice, notice of conditional acceptance. Um, you know, I, I conditionally accept your offer here that I owe uh, money to a third party interloper, which you are. Yeah, I have, if you can provide a contract that I have with you, if you can provide proof that I did not provide payment to the gas company, if you can provide evidence that I am not uh, uh, pursuing civil 
proceedings against the cast company for breach of contract with me. And if you can provide, so basically five points, right? Then I'm more than happy to settle this debt with you. By the way, if you can't provide these and you continue to solicit, attempt to solicit from me, which is what they're trying to do, they're trying to solicit business from you by engaging you. If you cannot provide this and you continue to attempt to solicit business from me, I'll hit you with a fourfold counterclaim plus costs. Attached is my fee schedule, which is for anything, for like mailing or answering the phone or writing a notice, minimum charge of $400. For going to court, minimum fee of $5,000. For going to, for doing anything to engage with you for anything other than what I've requested from you, which is an affidavit, these are my charges. So then if they do try to write, so they never wrote back, but then they try to email you still. So you just ignore the emails because you've already stated the only time, the only way I will accept communication from you is by notice mailed by registered mail accompanied with an affidavit. They don't do that. It doesn't count. So you don't have to answer anything. So my debt debt is discharged from the gas company. That's gone. I know it's gone because there's no, um, there's nothing against me except for this third party interloper, which is a debt collection uh, lawyer agency trying to send me emails. Because I know that they're nothing. That's just them attempting to solicit business from me. So technically, I could pursue them for breach of contract and and sue them for it. But that's just like, why would I do that? It's just too much effort. It's just, I already know that that debt is gone. It's never going to bother me. I discharged it. And these are just people trying to fish hook me, which I just ignore. It's as simple as that. So couldn't, couldn't they just turn your gas off? Or like, what happens if you try to get gas from another company? No. Well, I already did get gas from another company. Right. And so would you do that to so, them though? Well, I used a small local company. So the, the company I was using was a huge, the biggest one in Australia. The company that I use now is a local outfit and they don't have the ability to securitize a signature. So I pay them with cash because right. they can't, I can't pay them with my birth certificate. You know what I mean? Right. I could still use, I could engage this company that, um, said they didn't accept it the first time, but I can't be bothered dealing with them. So um, everything has is a thing. You've always got to pick your battles, right? And yeah, yeah. I've leveraged other ways that I don't pay for the gas anyway. So I'm either way, I'm not paying for the gas. It's just I've got I won't say how, but I've got I just got cre- I'll tell you off air. But <laughs> I've got creative ways of paying for things without paying without using my own money. So one is to use your birth certificate discharge liability to pay a debt, but that doesn't mean that's the only way you can do that. So I have other ways of meaning that I don't pay my I don't pay gas out of my own pocket. I don't use my own uh, productivity of my labour. So it's interesting. Mm. So for example, if if the tax man come to you, you could use a birth certificate to pay tax. You can use it to pay any any liability. Yeah. So get, uh, tax bills you can pay by acceptance of value, which is using a birth certificate. You can use a promissory note, which uh, is just essentially a promise to pay a bill of exchange, which is naming the parties involved and then uh, using what they send you to create a bill of exchange. It's a, there's a process. Mark's website has the process for a bill of exchange. and Or you could do the um, the uh, using a lesser amount to discharge a higher amount, which is where you offer the good faith. So you offer, if you had a $50,000 or pound tax bill and you offer a £5,000, you send them a check for it. They'll cash it probably, and then that's discharged the amount. Or they've held on to it for more than 72 hours. They've accepted it. They've accepted your terms and conditions as well because they didn't rebut them. This is a thing. I, I won a case. Uh, I won one of these cases recently because I'd sent somebody my counterclaim, which is by way of notice. said, um, you haven't backed up your claim. You haven't provided me with what I asked for, which was an affidavit. So here's my notice to you with an invoice. I'm invoicing you for the counterclaim, right? I did it three times and they're trying to claim that there was no contract. And, I, and so in the hearing, I said, well, didn't we contract? Didn't we form a contract by you uh, by f- way of three unanswered notices? I said, can you can you uh, show me where you answered any of the notices? And they said, well, no, well, we don't have to. I said, no, no. I've provided you with them by not answering them. You've can, you've answered. How is it that you don't have to? If you send a me notice, can I just say I don't want to answer it or do I have to, you know, they go, no. Well, there you go. So how do you think that it applies to you differently than it does to me? So then I said, is there anywhere on this notice that says that this is not negotiable? They don't answer. 
So they ask you, saying, look, I asked you a question. Is there anywhere on this notice that says it's not negotiable? Did not did I not provide a remedy? Did I not say that if you can't pay this in full, you can call this number and we can come to it? What did you ever call me? Did you ever write back? Is there anywhere here that says that I won't negotiate a, a different term with you? And then they either say no or they remain silent, which means that they say no because they remain silent. So then I won because they it was deemed that they were in breach of contract. And I offered them equitable remedy. I said, if you can't pay, you can contact me. We'll find out, you know, figure out another way. So this is the thing is that when you know this, when you know these processes, they always work in your favor. The only times that they won't is if you get a crooked magistrate or a crooked, um, you know, anyone that's the uh, administrator to handle the cases. But you can, for example, even something as large as the tax office, right? Let's say you... But would they come uh, after you if you started doing this to tax them? Like, if you say you can't pay it or you try and pay with an offer and in your bank account they yep. can see you've got a lot more money and you try and do that, wouldn't they do things? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, you, you, that's why you need to be creative about this stuff. You need to either set up, say, a private trust and put cash in there or you need to empty your account into somebody else's account or start a new account under a different name or just rip it all out in cash. You know, if you're a rich person, you got 500 grand, just call a bank ahead of time. I need to take out 500 grand, give them 24 hours notice, turn up. I need that 500 grand in a suitcase. Just take it home, put it in your closet. You do your process where it shows there's no money in your bank account. And then you just go and deposit the money again. For example, I'm not saying do that. I'm just saying that, for example, in Australia, when people go on to, it's called Centrelink. Centrelink is like welfare. So what happens is, a lot of people had to do this recently when they made it so that a lot of people couldn't go to work and they were offering welfare payments for people that couldn't go to work. But in order to access welfare, you need to do this checklist of who was your last employer? Do you have a separation certificate? How much money have you got in your bank account? Whatever, because you've got more than $5,000 in your bank account, they'll assume you can live off that to a point before they need to give you payments. So what everybody does is they go and empty their bank account. Then they show the account balance is $300 or $20, whatever. And so that's how they can get on welfare. Then they go and deposit their money back in their bank account. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily, a tax office is gonna be more savvy than the welfare office. Mm. So um, don't take this as advice, anyone listening to go and do that for your tax problem. But what I'm saying is that if you do use your brain and think about things, there are ways that you can, um, yeah, you essentially, I guess to answer your question more directly, you have to provide a profit and loss statement or a statement of accounts. That is your expenditures, your incomes, your outgoings, everything like that, so that a you can show that you do not have the means to pay a $100,000 tax bill. You've got to provide that, and you've got to provide that with an affidavit. So by saying that, that just means that you, if you're listening, this applies to you, you need to figure out ways to make that legit. It's just a creativity thing, right? A lot of people can figure their ways around these things. But if you didn't use that method, like I say, just pay it, but just don't pay it with your own money. Use a promissory note, use a bill of exchange, use a money order. These are financial instruments that you create. The funny thing about these is that you can't pay a debt with a debt, right? So we're only dealing with uh, fake debt or liabilities to pay a debt. But if you use fiat currency, which is banknotes, which is a debt instrument, then you're paying a debt with a debt, which actually increases the national debt, right? I don't mm. know if this makes sense yet. Yeah, yeah, because you're, if you, if you, if you yeah, use, yeah, 100%, I get what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, so if you use your own financial instrument, which is accessing credits in your treasury, that brings down the national debt. So you are actually, so this is why the debt's always going up. You are an enemy of the state. Yeah, yeah, so you are an enemy of the state if you use a debt instrument to pay a debt, Already? but you are an ally of the state if you use your own financial instruments, which is promissory note, bill of exchange, money order, or anything along those lines, the way you create the money by accessing with your signature, by accessing your money in treasury, that brings national debt down, you're an ally of the state. If you pay with fiat currency, your, your bills, 50s and 100s, you're an enemy of the state. Funny how that works. <laughs> Hmm. They don't tell you that, though. Interesting. So, okay, it's really interesting. So, like, it's the thing, my tax man, for example, might not know this or he, he, he or whatever, and so I'd have to start doing my tax myself to get into this, right? Or I'd have to start... No, some of, them, some of them can help. 
Yeah. Yeah. But there'll there'll be people that know how to use either a foundation or a, a registered trust or an unregistered trust. They know how to use these. Um, they're, they're tools. These are the tools that the wealthy elite use. All the wealthy elite have unregistered private trusts. Most of them have foundations as well. These are ways that you can legitimate. This is why Bill Gates Foundation. the super rich, right? The Bill Gates and that, they pay no tax, right? You know that. They don't pay tax. It's only the working class that pay tax and companies. Companies pay company tax. But when you're talking about income tax, that really only applies to the working class because there's all these super wealthy people who have billions at their disposal pay no tax. The reason they pay no tax is because they offset everything or they hide assets in. They don't own anything. Anybody that's wealthy knows it's a dumb idea to own anything. Everything is owned by the trust and by the beneficiaries in the trust. Even their pet cow or their pet dog owns the house. The tax office can never take that because they don't own anything. They can only, they and you can't go after a, anything that's held in trust because you're not the only one that owns that. That's owned by eight or 10 or 100 other people. So no one can take that asset and no one can take that cash. So you help, they hold cash in trust as well, in private trusts, non-registered trusts. This is what the wealthy elite do. But that doesn't mean that you can't use it. You earning a working class man's income can protect your cash and assets by way of foundations and private unregistered trusts as well because what applies to the elite applies equally to us. It's just that we're not taught about it. We're not taught how to use it, So, but we can use it. But So my company, for example, would have to pay tax? Uh, well, not if your company doesn't earn any money. Right. Interesting. Do you know what I mean? So by dispersing the cash and the assets amongst the trustees and the beneficiaries, the company can make no money. And that's also why you can buy an airline company for $1 or one pound, which has happened before, where uh, all the money has been written off and and put in through, and they're, they're kind of declared insolvent. Somebody writes a bill of exchange to take care of $800 million of debt that they have, mm. and and they they purchase the company for a dollar and a bill of exchange. So it's just, this is all stuff that the super wealthy do that we don't know anything about unless you start learning about it. And Mark teaches this sort of stuff. I'm, I know a bit, I know enough to tell you about it, but I don't do it because I make like, you know, I make like 20 or 30 grand a year. You know, I'm like a poor man in monetary terms. So in that, that works well for me though, because I am still very happy. I don't like, I don't really need more money, but I'm also that guy that nobody's ever going to come after. Like, why would you come after a guy who has nothing? It's only going to cost you money. So, um, but the way you can also make it seem like that if you do have money because you hide the money and assets in private trusts and foundations. Foundations are a great way to bring tax down because foundations pay no tax. You know how a foundation works? Go for it. Like yeah. a nonprofit NGO foundation. Yeah. Mm. So essentially they're tax exempt. Mm. And you just have to know how to run it through. You need to talk to anyone listening to this too. Don't try to do this on your own. You won't figure it out. Hire somebody who has a track record of setting up private foundations and things with for people and that they have been vetted by your country's tax office. So there's one guy, there's plenty of people in our country that charge stupid amounts of money to set up a, at a foundation for you, which actually doesn't cost anything. They just charge it and they don't know how to back it up and they've never vetted it with the tax office and they get people in a lot of trouble with the tax office. Um, the guys that Mark knows, and by the way, um, I have asked and he has affiliates in the UK, US and other countries as well. So when I do this interview on Tuesday, we'll make sure you guys get all the local affiliates. Um, remember you were asking before about local people? Perfect. So he'll also know of local people who can do this. So I know of one guy locally who can set up a foundation that has been vetted by the tax office. That means that it doesn't matter. That can go through any type of audit. It can go through any accountant or tax agent and it'll pass no problem. It'll, it's all completely above board. Some people set up foundations and trusts without really knowing how to dot the I's and cross the T's. And it means that if they ever get audited or anything like that, they can get in trouble because they haven't done it. They haven't set it up properly. So, um, yeah, that's just really key. So all of this is really doable, but it does mean that the individual has to find out exactly who has a proper track record, who has uh, success with this already, and don't just take... Don't just like hand your money to somebody who's going to say, yeah, I'll set up a foundation for you. It's $2,000 or it's five grand or whatever. You know, it's just, there's a lot of people that do that. 
there's uh, <laughs> there's people. So Mark, for example, can discharge a mortgage. Not many people can discharge a mortgage, but Mark can. Takes a lot of work to do that. Now he's run seminars on how to do that for yourself, right? Not to do it for other people, but to do it for yourself. What some people do is they go to his seminars, take his material, and then some people went Try off and started and charging it. people Believe it is. 50 grand. They were charging people 50 grand. They took Mark's materials. Mark doesn't charge like that. They, they took his materials and started telling people that they can discharge their mortgage easily and that they only have to pay him 50 grand. So for anybody that's not really thinking for themselves, that's a bargain, right? They've got a 500 grand mortgage. I just had to pay this guy 50 grand and my mortgage goes away. Of course they're going to pay it. So they got a number of people in the first month sign up for discharging a mortgage, got all of them in trouble. Not, it did not work for any of them because they, they just got material off Mark and then just went, I'm going to do it. And they charged 50 grand because none of this is regulated, right? So then Mark had to go in and fix all these problems for free because these people just did all their money paying these these crooks the money and Mark had to go and fix it all. And um, it's just crazy. But a lot of people do that. So you just have to be aware that you 100% can do this. You just have to do your due diligence to do it right, which means making sure you find the right people. Don't just hand your money over to anyone who says they can do it. Make sure that you check that they can do it properly. Mm. No, I mean, that's why I resonate with you, Tom, because it's like, you know, you, you can sort of tell when someone's a good guy, like when we're speaking, you know, it's, it's, it's a, um, yeah, you get that energy. You, people that rip people, I mean, I've had that on different coaches. Their material has been ripped off. My stuff's been ripped off because people, and when they do that, <laughs> they haven't been through the, the, it's like people can rip off your material, but when they come up against a hurdle, they're fucked because they don't understand how to yeah. do it because they haven't been through the, the wars to understand yeah. how you get there uh, or, or like mm -hmm. why you come to that conclusion or what you could do necessarily. So it's just like, that's why people say oh, to me sometimes, do you worry about people like stealing your material? I say, well, if, if I see it and whatever, I'll obviously say that, that that's ridiculous, but they can, for one, they're never you, so they can't like, they can't bottle you up and two, they, it's, they know just enough to get themselves in trouble. And that's why 100%. Mm. And look, to be honest with you, when you become like, for example, with health and other stuff, when you go deep into it, it takes a lot to even get an expert in something. That's why you want to know this stuff and get to being an expert in it, but also work with people, as you said, who know their stuff inside out. Because like my tax guy who's at the moment, I, I trust him and he's been great. But if I go down this road and change things around, then I will use people that, you know, people that, I trust who they trust because you know it's same as anyone, right? It's like you you meet your friends' mates on a stag do, for example. You most of you get on because they're like they're people that he likes, and this does that make sense? It's like give me there's yeah. there's like that common sort of energy, which is good. So no, I hundred percent. So okay, with the okay, there was one thing. So for people with it, at the moment, nothing's come out in terms of them saying we need to have mandatory vaccinations, but they have said that if you refuse it. How, how long have we got to get that these letters into people? Yeah, I reckon, you know, there's a lot of talk about the 1st of May. This was when all these mandatory things were going to come in, but we're at the 5th, 2nd of May, and we haven't had it come in, you know. So it's – what okay, so what this is is in terms of everything we've been speaking about already, what it is when a government or whoever comes out and starts saying these things, it's an offer. They have to give the offer to be able to see what people do in return. So this is our period of time where we need to either not consent or conditionally accept these offers. They're kind of two different processes and it depends on how far you want to take things. I like the, well, depending on the situation, non-consent is great because it just means I don't consent to this. Um, they, have to offer goes away. they have to offer you that, yeah? So at the moment they have an offer. They're already, they're all... They're already offering it because they're making public, uh, public meaning that um, even a movie, this this is this is actually um, okay. How do I explain this? Okay, I'll just explain one concept and it'll help to explain the broader concept. I think you can copyright your name. Now I should have copy. I've just never done it because I can't be bothered. But I should have copyrighted my name before my video. Out. Reason being that a lot of people tr tried to use my name against me, and if I copyrighted my name. I could sue them for, for using my intellectual property, which is my name, right? This is what the elite do. So a newspaper slanders a Bill Gates or whatever, he would have copyrighted his name. All the wealthy elite people copyright their names. 
And then if a newspaper or whatever you puts out a story against them and, and uses defamatory uh, statements and things using their name, they can sue that uh, company for, uh, you know, using their name against, which is their intellectual property. Now, the way you can copyright your name is that you just have to put notices in the legal section of a fairly well-read newspaper for three consecutive editions. So you do that. That's your that's your way of noticing the public three times that you intend to copyright your name. If anybody has, you basically put, I intend to copyright my name. If anybody has any objections, you must write to this address or you must put it into this legal section of the newspaper. Nobody reads it. Nobody's ever going to see it. But because nobody ever objected to that and you put it in three times, that is a public notice and you are now uh, you have now copyrighted your name. So somebody can only, well, I never got a copyright notice. And you say, well, it was in this newspaper three consecutive times. You and nobody else objected. So that's that's legal. So movies do this. They only have to put, this is really sneaky. They only have to put this, concept into three movies for example you know like we're going how many movies have you seen where a city's been locked down a quarantine mm. tons of them right like hundreds probably yeah, yeah. so the pub that that is public notice that that is what will happen when a virus gets loose and they can bring in the military and they can do this you can't go anywhere you're locked in your house you're locked in these cages on a football field that's because we've already been publicly noticed by way of even movies so what happens is we need to understand that when we are given public notice, the news counts. Uh, as of May 1st, we're going to introduce these new policies on quarantine and vaccinations and blah, blah, blah. If everybody just sits there going, oh, shit, I don't want that, that doesn't count. You've now been public. There's been a public notice. And if you're like me who doesn't ever hear it because I don't look at TVs, I don't look at my phone and I don't go on the Internet, I don't know. But that doesn't mean that the public wasn't noticed. And as far as they're concerned, I'm the public. So it's up to me to know this, you know, even though I've never been directly told. But what that means is that anybody that has been noticed, that's been put out there. Now you can go, um, I do not consent to mandatory vaccines. You just have to fill out a form that essentially is a notice of non-consent. Um, what we're going to do, so this interview, which I'm going to share with you, obviously I'll send it directly to you and you can share it with your listeners. Everybody that I've already, when I interview Mark, the reason I'm going to interview Mark mostly, is that I've been getting a lot of requests for how do I fill out this form, what films for forms do I do, and I'm like, it would be a full-time job for me to handle these inquiries. I can't do it. So I'm going to take the time to go and interview Mark. We're going to go through specifically how to fill out a form and not just how to fill out a form, but why things go in there in the right places. Why do you write your name and address up the top right and there's on the top left? Why do you sign on the bottom right? You know, Why do you not put it on the left? Little things like that. And once you understand it, it means that you don't have to rely on a template letter. I don't know where Mark's papers are. Is this the right one? Where do I send it? You know, that's what people are going to do. Even if you send them to the site, they go, I don't know how to fill it out. Where are I? And it's like, man, I, I can't answer 500 or 5,000 or 5 million people's queries, you know. So the idea is to teach a man to fish, you know, that expression. So the idea is once you understand what a notice is and why things go in, you can just write your own. It could be any notice. I don't consent to this. I don't accept that offer. You can write it to anyone. Notice, notice. You can fly them out the door. You know. This is the thing, though. So that's why we can do this. I mean, you know, you'd have to have like a whole pile of them and just send them out all the time. No. With what? Sorry. You need to have like a whole pile of them and just send them out all the time. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is there's there's benefit in sending a bunch out at once, actually. So I'm hoping that when enough people get this um, get this information, a lot of people do it at once. So that instead of dribs and drabs of notices hitting some of the government offices and the medical, do the same thing. You fill out a notice of non-consent and send it to a regular bot, regulatory body. They must take notice. If they don't, they're in breach of that notice and they're liable. So you're liable for a $200 fine if you ride a bike through a city mall. If there's a sign that says notice, don't ride a bike, otherwise 200 quid, you know. So it's the same thing. If they don't reply or and respond to your notice or take notice, they are now uh, liable for that. Well, how so would you reply to we that? we had 5,000... Pardon? And so how would, they, how would you notice for that? But sorry, go on. If we had 5,000 5, copies... So 5,000 people at a time sending in a notice and they're just bombarded with notices of non-consent, that's putting the pressure on them. They can't... 
they can't proceed with that. And you've put your notice in. That is your legal document then where, you know, your boss or somebody says, oh, you can't come back to work. You can't have a job now. Or the, the transport office says, oh, you can't have a license now. Then you just say, well, I gave in my non-consent and never came back. It's essentially, I'll explain this when I do it with Mark because there's a little bit of toing and froing that has to go on with this. But um, essentially what it means is that when you've noticed people and they don't reply, you are now, you can take that to a registrar at a court and the registrar can sign off with a court order that you are not now, whatever that offer was is cancelled. So the offer being you can't keep your job if you don't get a flu shot, you can't get a passport if you don't get a flu shot or a driver's license or whatever. That's the offer. The offer does not stand when you have given notice of non-consent or notice of conditional acceptance that was not rebutted. You can take that into a registrar at a court, which means you don't even have to go to a court hearing with a magistrate. The registrar can sign off on the court order of that, give it to you. That's your ticket right there. So anybody that tries, oh, you can't have a license. Well, here's a court order that says I can. You can't have a job. Well, here's my court order that says I can. You want to go against the court order? Sure, I'll see you for two and a half million dollars. Let's go. You know, nobody's going to do that. This is so that's what you need when you travel. Have a when you travel. Yeah, exactly. So you you really need to uh, first of all get a uh, an understanding of these basic concepts that we've been talking about. The difference between a man, a woman, and a person. You're not your name. All these things. You need to have a basic understanding of that. Once you've got that, and you're you're comfortable just standing your ground, not letting people encroach on you. From there, the next step is throwing it back. If you continue to push this, I am going to counterclaim you for four times what you've claimed against me. Or if you continue to try to talk to me, I'm going to report you to your indemnity insurer. We'll see if you still got a job next week. Or I'm going to include a $10,000 or a $10 million liability case against you if you continue to operate outside of your bounds. If you continue to operate outside of your bounds, you'll invoke the office of the Commonwealth public official just by threatening me as a Commonwealth public official, minimum two year jail sentence. These things like most people, you just need to get to that stage first of standing your ground. And once you've got that, then it can be the on the offense of threatening them back because most people don't care unless there's the opportunity to lose something. Mm. If they can lose their job or lose money or be sued, that's when they start going, oh, well, we'll back off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're worried about that. Yeah, it gives them something to uh, best form of defense is attack sort of thing. And it, once you've got your ground, now, it's yeah. really interesting yeah. this, mate, because... One part of me is thinking, oh, fucking hell, why is the why like why have I got to learn all this? This is such a pain in the ass. Got nothing's going on. Like, why can't the world just be yeah. full of good people? But you know, at the end of the day, yeah. it is what it is, and don't resist reality. Get yourself, get yourself like adult up, as Jason Christoph would say, and uh, get yourself learning this stuff because I think it's really important. And then once you've done that, if you have a court order, yes. you can you can travel. Like you got it pass, you got to travel. Yeah. This is my court order. Well. Your passport allows you to do that anyway. Like I really recommend back, anyone yeah. that's got a passport. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, they. this is the thing. So a, so let's just run through a passport scenario, right? We're at um, an airport, for example. I've already bought an airline ticket. I'm in, at Heathrow and I want to fly to Australia hmm. or you know Germany or something like that, right? And somebody says, oh, where's your vaccination form, right? And I say, and I say, what are you, hang on, what are you asking me? What? And they say, well, you can't travel. I say, well, I've got my passport here. No, no, no. I want your vaccination form. Where is it? I say, well, hang on a second. I've got my passport here and it says that the bearer of the passport must be given, you know, like helps in my travel. I cannot be impeded. Are you impeding me? Oh, no, you need your, no, 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 no. We'll worry about that form in a second. Are you impeding me? You're trying to tell me I can't get on this plane, right? And then they'll go, well, you need to, no, no, I asked you one more time. This is the third time, third and final time. Are you trying to tell me that you have the authority to stop me getting on that plane? Is that what you're telling me? Well, I, I'm an officer of, oh, well, I'm going to need to see some ID now. And what's your ID? Who are you anyway? You haven't identified yourself. Now they're going to pull out ID or whatever. Say, great, um, Joe, somebody, right? Okay, so you're a what? What's your source of authority? Well, I work for the airline department or the police or the whoever. I say, okay, great. So what's your source of authority though? What are you relying on? So I've told you I've got this passport. It says that anyone in your position has to help me travel, right? Well, I know, no, no, no. I've already noticed you three times. Now I'm going to need your indemnity and insurer information because, look, you might not know, but your superiors will know. And right now you're in a lot of trouble. Say, look, I have a duty of care. This is where you're being nice. I have a duty of care to notice you that you are in breach of several federal acts and codes. 
Now, if you want to keep your job, you're going to either need to put me onto someone higher than you or you're going to need to let me through because otherwise I am going to sue you and I'll make sure that you don't have a job. So now what do you want to do? And that's why if, let's say at the end of the day, they- You're so well versed in it, it's you. a joke. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah, well, let's say that they put their hand, this is what I'm hoping one day somebody does. I'm hoping a cop puts his hand on me, right? Whoa, that's assault. You've just assaulted me. Okay, I'm going to do what you say now because I feel threatened for my safety. But I'm just telling you right now, you've assaulted me and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue you and charge you to the letter of the law. You've just assaulted me. So now what do you want to do? What do you want, my name? Let's go. You don't want to put you in a holding cell? Let's go. Say, under duress and threats of menace, I'm going to comply because I really feel threatened right now. Threatening somebody is assault as well. So there's assault. There's various forms of assault. There's um, aggravated assault, assault, occasionally bodily harm. Um, this is a bunch of different ones. I don't know them all. There's Queen a bunch Queen of different Queen. types of assault. So now you, you can charge them with assault, which is going to be awesome because maybe you'll miss your flight, but you'll win hundreds of thousands of dollars in compensation. So there's a case law in Australia called uh, Plenty versus Dillon to get the year, 2001 maybe, something like that, 2005, um, where a cop turned up to a guy's place, wanted his daughter who was 15. The cop just goes, the guy just goes, get off my property. And the, the cop says, no, I'm here to question or to arrest or whatever this, this, and he just says, get off my property. The cop says, I'm not leaving. I'm here to arrest, blah, blah, And he just goes, third and final time, you trespass and get off my property. Cop kept, kept at it. The guy leaves the conversation, goes behind his shed, gets a plank of wood, comes out and just belts the cop with the plank of wood right over the head. So he gets arrested, right, for doing that. But when he goes to court, he wins $600,000 because the cop was trespassing. 600 grand and that's case law <laughs> how awesome is that mm. so that means that if a, if a cop or a, a airline security border patrol anyone who you've noticed them three times you've asked for, for validation that they have authority to stop you for traveling you've shown them the passport and they keep going where's your vaccination form whatever if they touch you that's assault they have no right to touch you so automatically that's that's a lot of money right there for assault right then there's, um, then there's, uh, what's the word? Uh, un, the word is unfettered. You know, yeah, well, there's that. But you have the right to travel unfettered. Now they are breaching your right to do that. That's another offence. There's, there's several. It would just, it would amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars in wins of in a court case if that goes to goes to court. So the thing is, the, at the end of the day, this is what everybody says. The first time they hear this, they go, well, do they know that though? Are they going to listen to you? The answer is no, they're probably not. So that's why you have to say, look, I have a duty of care to notice you that you are in breach of several federal acts right now and you can be in a lot of trouble for this. So what I suggest you do is you radio your superior because I don't want to see you go down for this and you're just doing your job. I know you're just doing your job. Yeah, so this is me being nice, right? I know you're just doing your job, but I would, I would almost guarantee you don't know this. But I have a duty of care to tell you that you're breaching a lot of these codes. First of all, look, read the inside of my passport. You're trying to stop me from traveling. Like you're going against this code, aren't you doing that? And they'll go, but I, no, no, don't answer the question because I think if you answer that question, you're going to incriminate yourself. So I'm telling you, you're in, bre you're in breach of this Commonwealth code on the passport. So I suggest that you radio your superior or you just let me through right now. So basically what you're doing is you're going to go after the one that has the liability. If their superior comes down and tries the same thing on, then they're the ones that are going to get in trouble. So this is, a lot of people ask this because they go, well, does the cop know that? Does the airline hostess or whoever is trying to ask for the form, do they know this? The answer is no, they probably don't. That's why you'd need to know this stuff because it's going to come out sometimes in a roundabout way. So for example, anybody that records this podcast and they write down, oh, Tom said this, and then he said that, and then he said this. And they're like, right, I know what I'm doing now. And they go into a, uh, up against yeah. a cop or someone, they go, they're like, I know what to say. Where's your source of authority? Second one, uh, can you stop this? Third one, and they just like, I know my three lines to say, that's not it. Because I'm only saying things based on the core principles. So I can use the core principle and say anything I want. In a different situation, I'd use three different lines. In a different situation, I'd use three other lines. Or I wouldn't even say anything. I'd just say, I don't answer questions. In a different situation. So different situations call for different responses, but your responses come from your inner uh, education and sense of knowing. You, you, you walk around as a man or a woman, who 
whoever you are. So you walk around as a man or a woman knowing that no law, code, act or statute applies to you. So everything that comes out of you radiates from that place, right? You're not using lines. It's like every woman knows that if a guy comes up to her and he's learned the three best pickup lines he can possibly learn from the world's best seduction experts and he's just a douche, it, it doesn't matter what he says. She's still not going to be interested if he says the three best pickup lines to yeah. seduce a woman. She's still not interested. But the right guy who is showing and communicating on, on with subtext that he desires this woman and he's the man, he's a man who desires women and he doesn't hide it. He could say the dumbest thing in the world and she's still interested. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So you can't walk around as a fearful human. Oh, good. I just know three lines to say and I'm going to get cops off my back. You're going to say those three lines and they're going to stand there and just go, well, what else do you got? And you're like, shit, I'm out. And then you go back to being that you're just exposed for that fearful being, you know? So you have to get to the stage where you walk around as a free man or a woman knowing that you have the right to travel, you do not have to talk to a cop or any some anyone who has a badge, Department of Health Services, Department of Travel. You don't have to talk to them. It's just so, yeah. Um, it's yeah. just a lot of people. It'd be easy just to, to to say yeah, rather than having to go through the whole thing, they put you in a jail cell or they touch you or whatever. It's like we're well, now going to call. It's a lot of people to go. Oh, I can't bother yeah. with this. That's why I was thinking if we get if it gets to it. Then I, if I've got holidays booked with people, I'm just going to book a flight like a few days earlier, just in case, um, just so I can, just yeah. in case anything happens like that, you know. Um, just, yeah. just does that make sense? Just in case anything happens, just so I can otherwise. It's, it's, just like... it's, it's rare that it would happen. I only bring it up because there's the potential for that to happen. But, only, but, but, but for that, but, I've never. But I was going to say, but vaccination hasn't been mandatory, yet, has it? So this would be the only no, issue. Not. So this would be the issue like if they were scanning for for. Yeah. The, the the nano chip, for example, then it would be here's okay. Here's here's a way that we can get around this as well, which uh, I'll bring up with Mark, but I'll just tell you now. The simple version is to reserve your rights at all times. So a man or a woman with rights has inherent rights. Rights are up here, and then your benefits and privileges are down here. So the way that people are thinking about this at the moment is that they're they're um, approaching travel like it's a benefit and a privilege mm. but it's not a benefit and a privilege it's a right. right but remember only men and women who are living beings have rights creatures of statute uh the dead the entities have benefits and privileges so they're approaching this as somebody who has benefits and privileges to travel by having benefits and privileges that's conditional that's conditional on if you get this vaccine if you sign this form if you do this if you do that but a man or a woman has rights you don't have to have. That makes sense. It's um, good stuff. You know, uh, right? So what, what you need to do, what you need to understand is that when you sign for a driver's license or a passport, you're signing a document. Now, when you sign a document, you agree to the terms and conditions and no one reads the terms and conditions. What happens is that you form an agreement anytime you sign for something. But agreement is not a contract. A contract is a higher level of like bindingness than an agreement. So the difference between an agreement and a contract is that a contract requires consideration. Consideration in legal terms just means a payment. So do you pay for a driver's license and do you pay for a passport? Yeah. You pay for it, right? So now that's consideration. So now you actually have a contract. You have contracted with the governing body that provides that license or that passport that you are going to abide by their terms and codes that they've listed that you never read. So on for a driver's license, that means that you've agreed that if you go, you will stick to certain speeds. If you go over these nominated speeds, you will be liable for a statutory penalty. A statutory penalty is a fine that they send you. But if you reserve your rights, then you reserve, you reserve your rights. It means that you don't agree to come under their codes of you will be fine for this, you will be fine for that. So several people in our country, and I think other countries too, have got an infringement in the mail, a statutory infringement. You went 30 k's an hour, miles an hour over this speed limit. Here's a X number of dollars fine. They've sent in a photocopy of their driver's license, which has their all rights reserve, which I'm going to explain to you in a second. They sent it back saying, you just show me where you have authority over an all rights reserve license holder. And then that fine goes away. Because they, they don't. They don't have authority over somebody who reserves their rights. So how do you reserve your rights? So the way you do that is that when you 
do your application for a driver's license or a passport. Now, if you already have a driver's license or a passport, have you ever lost one? Gone yeah. to a party, shit, my wallet's gone. Yeah, yeah. Right? So people lose their, their licenses and passports all the time. So you just need to go into a office. Hey, look, I lost my passport. I lost my driver's license. So they go, well, that's fine. Just fill out, um, have you got some other ID? Yeah, here it is. Okay, just fill out your form again. So this time when you fill it out, you always have the box to put your signature in. Inside that box, you're going to sign it slightly differently. You're going to write by, B-Y. Then you're going to write on the bottom, all rights reserved. And then above all rights reserved, you do your signature. Your signature must touch, yeah? So you got, say that again. Ask. So inside the box, so it's a box, okay? On the okay, so inside, and what's very important is that you don't go outside the box. If it goes outside the box, it gets cropped. Okay. So it, our driver's license ones in Australia, it's this tiny rectangle. It's real thin. It's almost yeah. impossible to write it in there. You just yeah. got to write it small. Keep it in the box. So you write by, B-Y. Mm -hmm. By means by accommodation. That means that you are acting on behalf of the name. So now you're not agreeing to being the name anymore. You are, you are acting by accommodation of the name. So B-Y, underneath that, so by will be, it's too hard to... I should sure. have written yeah. it out for you. Yeah, cool. But I'll use my phone. So imagine imagine I'm signing on here. I would write BY here yeah. on this level. Mm -hmm. And then below that, on this level, I write all rights reserved across here. Yeah. Right? Now, so you've got BY here, all rights reserved here. Now, in this space above the all rights reserved, you do your squiggly signature, whatever your signature is. And it must touch the letters, the, the writing that says all rights reserved. The reason that it needs to touch is that some people might be sneaky and crop out the all rights reserved and just include your signature. They can't do that if the signature touches the all rights reserved. So you is, also it got, is all rights reserved got to be printed or should it just be, is it okay to write yeah, it? Yeah, just written. written. And then, and then you, so... Oh, no, uh, no, it's literally, literally your so hand. Something like, so something capital like, A. Something like that. You show me a... It's super blurry. Uh, you see that? Or yeah, not? all rights... That's exactly how you do it. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly how you do it. Yeah. Right. So it just needs to be, uh, on, like, on, it's just your, printed in, like. And on your passport you as well. You did right, though. On your passport as well. So what, now, here's what some people are going to ask, because everyone asks this straight away. They go, what if they say you can't do that? <laughs> right. What if you want to do your rights reserve signature? And they go, well, you can't do that. Hmm. So you would say to them, really, you have authority to tell me how I can and can't sign my name. Is that what you're saying? Show me your source of authority. You know, that's nobody's ever going to ask. But at the end of the day, what you need to do, though, is you need to get the original. So when you hand in the application, you need to say, uh, I would like a copy of my application form, please. Sometimes I might go, well, what do you want that for? And you would say, well, you know, I do business. And anytime I do business, I get a, a copy of my transactions, don't you, when you do business? And they go, oh, yeah, okay, well, that seems fair enough. So you just the reason that you want to get the copy of the original application is because if for any reason it went to court or something like that and they question that you've just written that on afterwards, you need to show that the original was signed all rights reserved. The original application was signed all rights reserved, not just your passport or driver's license. So you keep that on your file. So this is a way that it's that simple that you reserve your rights. Now, you still need to use the right language. If people, You still need to not answer questions. You still need to do the right things. But it's another level of protection when people are trying to take away our rights, which is what's happening now. People are trying to say you can't go places. You will have to get a vaccine or a microchip if you want to do this and that and the other. So we just need to put in place these various levels of protection of our rights. A, understanding who you are. B, writing the notices of non-consent. C, uh, reserving your rights on any official document like a driver's license or a passport. And you just stack these all up together and it, it just makes somebody much more impervious to, to a governing body pretending to have the right. They're only pretending to take away our rights to do things. Well, you said that before about the rights and the benefits and privileges. It makes massive sense. Like, these are my rights. And it's sort of when you mm -hmm. start to put it in there it starts to make sense you start to actually understand how these things fit in rather than just it being all like a mumbo jumbo you start to actually understand where you where you are with this rather than and I sort of and I've only been dug into this like the last couple of weeks and I feel like after 12 months you'd be like okay 
Uh, if you if you listen to it, yeah. like turn off the turn off the news, stop watching the crap on Netflix, and, and start learning this, and yeah. you'll be in, in a much better place. Because as you said, these are my rights, and then well, because then you actually know what you're talking about. And if you touch, you can say all these things. Like, for example, you know, said so before, as you said, it's like teaching someone one punch. You, if they come back with something else, you need to, it takes time to develop these things. It's a skill, and it's yeah. as much an art. Yeah. It's a science. Because if they come at you with certain things, yeah. you need to stand your ground and be calm in those conversations rather than being over the place. I think we've covered a lot. That's there. a really good point. Go on. Yeah, well, just with that, Ryan, you, you do. If anybody's using this, you must remain calm. If you raise your voice, if you get uh, if you get aggressive, you're assaulting the other person. You're going to lose. You have to remain in honor. In the world of commerce, there is honor and there is dishonor. You must always remain in honor. You remain in honor by not remaining silent. If somebody asks something, you don't just shut up. That's dishonorable. You must always just say, hey, look, I don't answer questions. That's fine. That's If you, if you don't know what to say, if you don't know how to ask a question back, your best defense is, oh, I don't answer questions. Hey, I asked you, no, no, sorry, look, I don't answer questions. Because you don't have to, by law, you do not have to answer the questions, but you can't remain silent. The other thing you can't do is just start getting aggressive. Because when people feel threatened, they tend to, ah, they get aggressive, right? They'll raise their voice. They'll get, they'll start well, acting a bit. if someone tries to tell you you can't go on a plane and starts getting hands on you and moves in you, moving exactly. you away, then it would be like, exactly. what do I do? It's like, I want to get on my flight. Like, what would if, you? Yeah. So if you kick up a stink and get hysterical and start yelling at staff and all that sort of stuff, they then have the right to detain you. Before that, they don't have a right to touch you, detain you, arrest you. That's all false detainment, false arrest. They're all offenses. You can charge them with that until the point that you start raising your voice and, um, and uh, you know, what's the word when you uh, abuse? Yeah. It's abusive so it's if they, to it's airport if it's staff. A, then, yeah. Well, say, say that you were doing that and you were being calm and they said, we come over here. You're like, I'm not moving. But they start because they said, I don't have to. I'm going on the plane. And they started to move you. Then what you walk with them, you say, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing this because I'm, what is it you said? You say, look, I'm, I'm scared now, I'm threatened, I'm going to go with you because you, I'm under duress. Yeah, yeah duress, and, duress and threats of menace because those are, those are legal terms that you can't, you can't put somebody under duress and you can't use menace to get somebody to do something. So when you say duress and threats of menace, that's your safeguarding yourself from uh, anything that they're doing. And it means that anything that they're doing, you're not contracting. Because if somebody says, come with me, and you come with them, you've contracted. Mm. You're doing what they say. Mm -hmm. So if you say, look, I will come with you, but only under duress and threats of menace, now you're not contracting with them. You've stated that you don't want to do that, but you are doing it out of threats mm. to your personal safety. Mm. So now it's fine. You're not forming a contract, and they're the ones that are in default. Really, actually, of interest of what we were talking about earlier in the conversation about the queen and the Bible and all that sort of stuff. And you are talking about, you know, when you, you've got it now about rights and benefits and privileges, the Bible actually says that we, we don't just have rights. We have dominion. Dominion is above rights even. So when you, again, it's just, and this is, this means that because the queen believes that all of the assigns believe that all of the courts believe that as a man or a woman, you have dominion. Dominion is superior to rights which is far superior to benefits and privileges. So, um, yeah, just like I say, like little things like this, you start to know it, you just start to go, man, this is all stacked in my favor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's also, I think if people listen to this and then they listen to your interview with Mark, it's going to get them a long way and then they go to uh, solutionsempowerment.com, empowerment.com. Yep. Like, and, and then we'll also, if you send me over the links to, to people in the UK that they can use, it would be great because then because yeah, I want to get this, I'm going to do my passport, my driver's license, and I want to get these these documents off of vaccination, and then setting up a trust uh, yep. foundation and yep. sorting out attacks. I think this is all all part of it, right? Because yeah, and then you understand yep. it. So um, the passport and driver's license. I and role I'm, play it. Yeah, mate. I'm gonna role play it. Don't as worry. Well. You're gonna so, be my you're gonna be my new best friend, Tom. We're gonna be role playing. Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyone listening to like 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 put situations, put scenarios together. You know, get somebody to pressure you. What do I say when this? Because a lot of people have it in their heads. They go, I, I, all I have to say is, am I under arrest or am I free to go? And that's in their head. Am I under arrest or am I free to go? Am I under arrest or am I free to go? The first thing a cop comes up to it and they go, what's what's your name? Oh, my name's Bob. Oh, here's my ID. <laughs> Just goes right out the window. What's Because it's in their head. It's not in their body yet. Mm -hmm. So when you're learning some of these principles, role play it. 
Like I role played this a lot. And when I didn't have somebody to role play it with, I'd use the rear view mirror in my car while I'm driving. I'd look at myself and I'd answer questions to myself. Go, oh, you got a license there? And I'd say, oh, am I under arrest? Why are you asking me these questions? And I would just drill it to myself. So now it's in my body. So if a cop or any anyone asks me a question, I come back with, I don't answer questions. Or I come back with, who are you? Why are you asking me these questions? Or look, am I under arrest or am I free to go? Do you need my help? Because I only stop because you used your emergency lights. Are you? Do you need my help? If not, I've done my duty of care. I'm going. You know, I practice these things. So people need to know that it doesn't matter what you learn just from in your mind. Mm. The, what matters is what is what your reactions are. Mm-hmm. And even if you learn this stuff in your head, your reactions are always going to be the same unless you change your reactions. So you have to practice with other people. You have to get them to put you on the spot so that you think on your feet and you know the responses. That's the only way you're going to be successful with it uh, in real life. But the other side of that is that if a lot of people are doing it, then your airport staff and that, they are going to know it because they're going to, shit, this is the fifth guy today that's asked me to provide some form of authority. I better learn it. Like now I know about it because my boss has told me that if I say this thing to that guy again, I'm going to get fired. But it, it works. Like the system does work. It's just that you don't know it and they don't know it. So it's like, You've got to start putting the pressure on. That's why cops nowadays, they don't, um, if somebody asks them for their indemnity insurer information, they pretty much just like let it go. They walk off because they know they can get fired because a few of them have got fired now. So, um, you know, it, more people need to do this. That's the key. Indemnity insurance, mate, they definitely do. And uh, uh, Indemnity insurance details or your indemnity insurer's number. That's pretty much what you want to ask for because that's the – Everybody in these government positions, the government is a corporation. So anybody, especially police, police became privatized long ago. Police used to be called peace officers and they used to be employed by the government. They got a paycheck from the government. This is why if, even if they pulled you over and you were drunk you were, and, and you didn't look like you were an asshole and you didn't like you've been having some beers, have you, Ryan? And you, yeah, I've had, like, I've had like six. And then they'll say, um, oh, well, look, just. Just go home and sleep it off. Like, make sure you be careful, all right? Like, don't do anything stupid on the way home. All right, see you later. They would do that. They would let people, they would be in charge of public safety, right? Maybe when you're not old enough or whatever, but that, they used to do that with people. It was only since the late 70s into the early 80s, or actually early 80s in our country, that it was all privatized. And then they started having to give out a certain number of fines and uh, infringements a month to fund the precinct that they're a part of. They're yeah. all paid on ABN. Mm. ABN is an Australian business number. It's not a tax file number that the government pays you on. So they're all Criteria to me, yeah. individual. Yeah, they're all agents for the corporation they work for. So they have to hand out these fines to pay for their own income. So um, they're, which also means that they come under public liability uh, laws and all that sort of stuff, where if they step out of line of their codes, they are personally liable not the police, them personally, so they won't risk it. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's going on another tangent. But just know what you just have to understand is that when you start looking into it, you uh, you find that things are stacked in your favor as long as you remain in honor the whole time and as long as you know that even if things don't go your way initially, like right in front of your eyes, in a roundabout way, it's going to end up in your favor if you hold your position. And if you can't, um, that's why, you know, Mark is training people up. That's why there are people in your country. We're going to find out who they are, but they're also training people up. So you want to get into groups with these people and, um, you know, kind of, kind of become an army of well-informed and well-equipped people, men and women on the street, not persons. So we all know how to stand our ground. And, and at that time, maybe hopefully some of these people who are in these positions of trying to impose these things on us, maybe they turn around, and they go, well, shit, I, I want my rights too. So they quit their jobs and do something else, and you know, I think it can change. We just have to. Of course, yeah. mate. This is like resistance. This is like a bit of like the Matrix when we were all like, uh, yeah, the whatever they call that the, the, on that ship which goes against like Agent Smith, and it's they all are right. It's just it's they can morph into it's yeah. what they are, yeah. And so, mate, I think we covered loads here. It was wicked, and people got lots to take away from. So, yep. thank you very much, Tom. And definitely, you'll uh, be back on the show. I will. I'll definitely make sure of that. But um, I think people are going to get a lot from this. So, thank you very much for taking it awesome. out of your busy schedule, mate. Because um, I think it's valuable information people need to hear. Yeah, you're welcome. And within uh, a few days, we'll have Mark's interview up, and I'll share that with you, and you can share it with your with your uh, 
listeners as well. Awesome. Can't wait for that. So, guys and girls, that was episode 154 with Tom Barnett. I hope you got a lot from that. You're going to probably have to go and listen to that again. Uh, I know I'm going to listen to it as well uh, again. Uh, so much information in there. And I hope it's just giving you a sense of power like that. It doesn't matter what's going on in, in the statutory world, um, in the world of statutory law, when it comes down to our actual rights, they far out, outweigh our privileges and benefits. And if you just know these, 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 if you know your rights, if you know the law, the law, the common law, then you're going to be onto a winner. In fact, some of the um, same things that Tom mentioned in terms of videos, I'm going to try and put a link below. But that is actually, uh, if you go into solutionsempowerment.com, they got the videos that he mentioned about um, the guy in, I think it's Brisbane or Melbourne, uh, having a standoff with 15 different police officers, and they eventually leave because he knows his rights, he knows the law, and they can't do anything about it. So really really important and, we, and as i said before looking looking uh, go and get your passport looking inside of it and see what it says about how you have the right to travel and how people need to actually assist you in that travel so don't be scared about us not being able to travel if you don't get your vaccinations etc so we're going to lots have to probably go through again as i said um so i hope you got a lot out of it i will be getting tom back on at a later date he's actually got an interview coming out with the founder i think of um i think it's a founder or at least the owner of solutionsempowerment.com um and when that comes out I'll, he's going to send me a link to it so we can put it up so once again it'll go through uh the laws the common law and also things you can do straight away i actually did uh just as you saw in the, in the, in the podcast i actually did show you what you need to do in terms of writing um uh for your passport so your passport sorry for your driver's license in terms of uh, keeping your reserve reserving your rights and i think it's going to go into a lot more detail around that that sort those sort of issues so that's it for this episode um as always if you are looking for help in overcoming a chronic health issue please give me a, give me a, a message you know i'm here to help send me an email at ryan at revive yourself dot co you can also find uh my book the chronic fatigue solution at www.thechronicfatiguesolution.com it's going to give you the three big secrets to health and healing as well as 52 other tips you can implement straight away um that's actually now a digital download as well as the audio version because the publishers unfortunately are closed and they can't get it out so um that's we turned it into a digital version so you can get that there and as i mentioned before if you're if you're looking for any of the top health boosting supplements on the planet head on over to www.reviveyourself.co click on the shop link and you'll be able to to find what you need there otherwise that's it for this episode guys and girls as always stay happy stay healthy and i'll speak to you soon Bye bye